Um, Rachel and I are going to uh, double team the introduction of Harvey a little bit. So I'm going to hand over to Rachel now. Uh, so Patrick's going to give a formal introduction to Harvey, but I just want to kind of tell you about the conversation that myself and Patrick had that lead us, uh, led us to inviting him. That in particular, a year ago, we asked ourselves, what is it that our discipline will need to be talking about in a year's time? And at the time, uh, Dear White Central, which was a student movement at the Royal Central School of Speech and Drama, was at its height. And in particular, um, a series of um, uh, claims were being made by the students. But one of the central elements was that black experience wasn't represented within their curriculum. Uh, also, uh, colleagues Rayona Mitra and uh, Broderick Chow were at the time uh, thinking of staging an event which happened in April, I think it was, um, uh, originally called uh, Theatre Studies is So White. Um, and I think those provocations are really uh, central to some of the things that Harvey's been doing throughout his career. So the idea of getting him over here from Boston to talk about his own research is, for me, vital to the future of our discipline. Um, so I'm super excited of what's about to happen. Um, so I, I'm delighted to welcome Harvey to TAPRA, uh, and it's very exciting to have him here for the keynote. So just a little bit uh, about him for those of you who may or may not know. Harvey is Dean of the College of Fine Arts at Boston University, and before that he was Professor and Chair of Theatre at Northwestern. And as we said this morning, he's the immediate past President of the Association for Theatre in Higher Education. As Rachel has intimated, his research focuses on the performance and experience of race, exploring urgent political issues in critical race studies, cultural and social history, and in performance studies. He's published seven books, including Embodying Black Experience, uh, which was winner of Book of the Year uh, from the uh, National Communication Association in the American Society for Theatre Research. And most recently, he co-authored Black Theatre uh, black Theatre is Black Life, an oral history of Chicago theatre. So his work is politically, socially and culturally urgent. His research has been widely published in academic journals, but also beyond the academy. It's been profiled in major newspapers. And moreover, Harvey is a commentator on popular culture and he's appeared on CNN, Good Morning uh, America and a number of other um, programmes, as well as having his work published in The New York Times, The Washington Post and The Wall Street Journal. So his research has found significant purchase in the academy, but also importantly beyond it, speaking about why what we all do might actually be quite important elsewhere. Something that I think is urgent for our discipline now and urgent for theatre and performance studies globally. So please give a warm welcome to Professor Harvey Young. Uh, thank you, Rachel. Thank you, Patrick. It's, it's, a, it's a joy to be here. Uh, and also a special shout out to uh, uh, Sally uh, uh, Smerdin, uh, who you know, handled the logistics um, and was patient with me as I was slow to respond uh, to her a couple of things. Uh, but it's, it's a thrill to be here. Uh, and uh, a special shout out to uh, David Calder and uh, Adrian Curtin, who our paths crossed many, many a time uh, you know, in Chicago at Evanston, in Evanston at Northwestern. So it's great to sort of be in the same uh, building um, as them. Uh, so let me just dive in here. Uh, I, I acknowledge the fact that, you know, next up is a wine reception. So, <laughs> yeah, so, so, so let's do this. <laughs> in the 1985 B-horror film, uh, The Reanimator, Herbert West, a medical student, devises a serum that gives new life to the dead. When injected, the greenish-yellow fluid powers the previously still body. The corpse moves, walks, sexually assaults, and of course kills. It's a horror film. Uh, for, the newly, for the newly animated, the serum re reactivates brain function. The walking dead not only remember, but they also act in a premeditated manner. Now mobile and cognizant of their no longer dead status, they are not happy. The film's trailer hints at this, and I quote, Herbert West brought a lot of dead people back to life. Not one showed any appreciation. <laughs> Lo loosely adapted from H.P. Lovecraft's 1922 short story, Herbert West Reanimator, the film debuted at the Cannes Film Festival, received mixed to positive reviews, and created just enough interest to inspire a sequel, The Bride of Reanimator. 
<laughs> Produced and directed by Stuart Gordon, founder and director of Chicago's Organic Theater, which was the early theatrical home of David Mamet. Uh, the reanimator was intended to be a stage play before plans were set aside to be, you know, for, you know, for the cinema. Now, it is the dead black body imagined to have been given new life that exists as the central concern of this talk. Whereas the reanimator almost exclusively frames whiteness, here the focus is on the intersection of blackness and death within the real everyday world. It centers both on the frequency with which the black corpse appears within everyday life and on the manner with which the precarious existence of black folk prompts an awareness of the, of the futurity of death. Today I spotlight black death and the undeadness of blackness. I address how the spectacle of black death, the hypervisible before an audience display of dead bodies, has long existed within American history and look to the stage to reveal how black theater, from Amir Baraka's Dutchman to recent Black Lives Matter performances has covered this issue. The backdrop of American history has featured the spectacle of black death for centuries. The horrific treatment to which black women and men were subjected, often by uh, white women and men who alleged mastery of their bodies, has been well documented. In his 1845 autobiography, abolitionist Frederick, D Frederick Douglass recounts the experience of Denby, a black captive who in the midst of a public lashing sought refuge in nearby Creek. Refusing the command of an overseer by the name of Mr. Gore, he was shot dead. Douglas writes, and I quote, the first call was given. Denby made no response, but stood his ground. The second and third calls were given with the same result. Mr. Gore then, without consultation or deliberation with anyone, not even giving Denby an additional call, raised his musket to his face, taking, at, taking deadly aim at his standing victim, and in an instant, Poor Denby was no more. His mangled body sank out of sight, and blood and brains marked the water where he had stood. A thrill of horror flashed through every soul upon the plantation excepting Mr. Gore. Now, Douglas reports that the murder of Denby was enacted in order to curtail a demonstration of resistance, which, as imagined by Gore, might inspire other captives to resist authority. In addition to the fact of Denby's desk, death, uh, not desk, yeah. Uh, <laughs> Douglas expresses alarm at a social structure that normalizes and accepts the public abuse of black bodies. With frustration evident in his prose, Douglas notes that Gore's, quote, horrid crime was not even submitted to, ju to judicial investigation, and quote, his fame as an overseer went abroad. Despite the fact that the murder was committed in the presence of slaves, the fact that captives lacked legal standing meant that, again quoting Douglas, one of the bloodiest and most foul murderers goes unwhipped of justice and uncensored by the community in which he lives, end quote. Douglas matter-of-factly observes, killing a slave or any colored person in Talbot County, Maryland is not treated as a crime either by the courts or the community. Before enumerating additional examples of black captives, both female and male, beaten and abused, uh, both, female and male, both female and male who were beaten, abused, and killed. Now, to state the obvious, Denby was neither the first nor the last African American to be killed in the US, ostensibly for being black. Every generation has had its Denby, and there were always more than just one. With alarming regularity, men and women were hanged throughout the United States between 1880 and 1930 as unwilling participants in legal lynchings, murders sanctioned by community and effectively immune to prosecution. The murder of Emmett Till in 1955 in Mississippi and the display of his bloated, disfigured corpse awakened a generation of youth from boxer Muhammad Ali to Black Panther founder Bobby Seale to the precariousness of black life. Today, it can be a challenge to hold the many lives lost. Trayvon, Tamir, Sandra, Philando, Michael, Eric, Laquan, among others. Within almost every scenario, the dead body attracts the eye. The dead body sinking in the creek, hanging from a tree limb, reclining in a casket, left on the street invites consideration. Taking a long view in history, dead black bodies are omnipresent. They are everywhere and unavoidable. They cannot not be encountered. It was the everydayness of recognizable abuse and suffering that inspired me to write my first book, Embodying Black Experience. Part of the impetus for that project was the cultural criticism of the late 1990s. At the time, there was a critical move to imagine a future free from the racial restrictions of the past. Critics increasingly began to point to sociologist W.E.B. Du Bois's 1903 forecast that the 20th century would be the era of the color line as a prompt to make their own racial forecast for the 21st century. 
Whether steeped in optimism or a neologistic spirit to create a new brand identity, perhaps to book in the new Negro with the post-black, this, this trend became increasingly noticeable. As critics began to articulate a being in the world that existed either beyond or was not delimited by blackness, I did not see this position existing in the world in which I lived. I did not see black people who had the ability to not be seen as black, even as they possessed, as we all do, complex intersecting identities. I saw folks continuing to be assaulted, racially profiled by police, subjected to hiring discrimination, unjustly imprisoned, and continually reminded of their blackness. In researching that first book, I sought to connect those experiences, to trace a through line from the past to the present with the aim of revealing how such events recur and repeat across generations. In embodying black experience, the focus was on the frequency with which black bodies were abused and how they asserted a stand in defiance of that abuse. A similar commitment here exists here today with an emphasis not on suffering, but on death. The ability of theater to resurrect and reanimate the stage uh, makes this, uh, sorry, the, the ability of theater to resurrect and reanimate makes the stage a useful place at which to consider the phenomenon and the experience of black death. Numerous theater performance scholars have invited their readers to envision the theater and allied social performances as occasions marked by surrogation and haunting. The theater itself has been imagined to be a moribund entity, always on the verge of expiring or being spent. It has been celebrated for its phoenix-like resurgence, its againness, a repetition with a difference, which is not not the original. Even its props have been imagined to have a life, continuously reanimated in performance. Although death looms large in most drama, you know, it, it can be said to launch the actions in Oedipus Rex as well as Hamlet, it is especially present in literary and theatrical representations of black life. This is evident in, Bar in Amiri Baraka's play Dutchman, which ends with the lifeless body of the young black male protagonist Clay being thrown from a subway car and subsequently the arrival of a, of a, of a new young black male subway rider who seems destined to, to re-experience his Clay's fate. An immediate critical success, um, it was a 1965 Obie Award winner, um, uh, Dutchman appealed to both the Greenwich, the, the Greenwich Village crowd and also uh, to the popular uh, residents who lived in Harlem, because what, what Baraka did was he, after it, it, it appeared in Greenwich Village, he took the same production and staged a street theater in Harlem. Um, its continuing appeal stems from Baraka's ability to innovate a new dramatic style influenced by the beat writers and his commitment to portraying the embodied experience of African Americans in a recognizable manner. Dutchman features two characters, Clay and Lula. Clay, 22, is a well-dressed, mild-mannered man who travels via subway to visit a friend. When the play opens, he sits quietly in a subway car. Lula, and I quote Baraka here, a tall, slender, beautiful woman with long red hair, end quote, who is a decade older than Clay, enters wearing, quote, bright, skimpy summer clothes and scandals. Although other seats are available, she walks toward Clay, stands next to him, and hovers over him. She awaits his acknowledgement before making a declaration that is thinly disguised as a question, I'm going to sit down, okay? They talk and briefly flirt with one another. Sex, or at least the possibility of sex, is in the air. The attraction ends abruptly as their dialogue becomes more pointed and critical. <clears throat> Lula disparages Clay, essentially calling him a fake or a phony. She tells him, boy, those narrow-shouldered clothes come from a tradition you ought to, be, to feel oppressed by. A three-button suit, you can see the rest up on the screen. Relentless in her critique of, Lula, of Clay, Lula succeeds in tapping into his reserve of anger at society at large for its racism. In response, he freely, publicly expresses his discontent. At one point, Clay proclaims, shit, you don't have any sense, Lula, nor feelings either. I could murder you now, such a tiny, ugly throat. I could squeeze it flat and watch you turn blue. The tension escalates until Lula stabs him. Fellow passengers aid her by tossing Clay's lifeless body from the train. The scene resets with the entrance of the new subway rider. Written in the 1960s, when Baraka, then Leroy Jones, was an acolyte and friend of the beat poet Allen Ginsberg, Dutchman merges an existentialist perspective with a recognizable narrative arc steeped in a social political critique of the real world. Ginsberg's poems helped get Baraka to appreciate the power of contemporary poetry to reach a popular audience and to lodge critique. Reflecting on Ginsberg's influence, Baraka recalled, and I quote, I liked the whole attack on American society thing the whole use of language that was unknown or not used in a kind of academic polite society. Much like the beat authors, Baraka's early poetry placed a spotlight on subjective experiences of the everyday world 
that often doubled as a form of political or social critique. However, it differed in that it initially hinted at and later more explicitly focused on experience of blackness. He opens his poem, An Agony As Now, 1964, um, which was published just before Dutchman was premiered, with the following. I am inside someone who hates me. I look out from his eyes, smell what foul tunes come in to his breath, love his wretched women. The poem, as Los Angeles Times critic Hector Tobar observes, begins with a writer in a crisis. It is this crisis, previously framed by Du Bois as double consciousness, and now expanded to more fully consider the internalized conflict of intersecting identities, which defines Baraka's dramaturgy. Such a crisis appears in, and perhaps may have inspired Dutchman. Baraka, referring to the process of composing his most famous play remembers, when I wrote Dutchman, I didn't know what I had written. I stayed up all night and wrote it and went to sleep at the desk, then woke up and I looked at it and said, what the fuck is this? Uh, <laughs> In, in Dutchman, Baraka steeps his play in the everyday experience of being black within the US. The poet playwright understands that abuse, violence, and even death can target African Americans at any moment, including within seemingly benign settings. In a 1998 interview, the playwright credits his grandmother for teaching him about this fact of tragic blackness. And here I'm gonna read the whole thing. My grandmother would tell me all the time about this black boy they accused of raping this woman and they cut off his genitals and stuffed them in his mouth and then made all the black women come there and watch. My grandmother told me that story when I was a little boy. Why would your grandmother tell you that story? Right, because she wanted you to remember that shit forever. The story told by Baraka's grandmother is cautionary. She offers a perspective on racial violence within their shared world and advises her grandson to keep his distance from white people in general and white women in particular. This warning also appears in Dutchman. Amir Baraka identifies Clays as a victim. In his 1965 article, Revolutionary Theater, he asserts the necessity of establishing a tragic theater that brings attention to the experiences of the vulnerable. He writes, and I quote, our theater will show victims so that their brothers and the audience will be better able to understand that they are the brothers of victims and that they themselves are victims if they are blood brothers, end quote. Baraka's revolutionary impulse is what ultimately sets his dramaturgy apart from the Greenwich Village and Beat authors. Although there is a similar dedication to creating an impressionist theater of a sort, a theater that represents an individual's perspective on the world, Baraka's early theatrical writings, especially Dutchman, underscore the importance of creating art that has the potential to serve as a catalyst for social change and political involvement. There is a commitment to realism in an effort not only to reach audiences and help them connect what they are seeing with their lived realities, but also to inspire activism. Tragedy for Baraka exists not in fabricating a story in which a protagonist exists only to fall as a consequence of poor choices or willful neglect of morality. It is a straightforward depiction of black life as it is lived. It is exemplified in the experience of Emmett Till and the boy introduced in Baraka's grandmother's story. Their experiences are neither extraordinary nor rare. In fact, they're quite ordinary and everyday. Baraka's theater of tragedy exists as a study of quotidian violence targeting black bodies. Clay does not act in a spectacular manner. He simply sits and rides a subway. Nevertheless, he becomes the victim within Baraka's dramatic narrative. The tragic imposes itself upon him. In an article published the same year as the world premiere of Dutchman, uh, John von Zaleski commented on the state of then contemporary tragedy. He writes, and I quote, amid all the conjecture about the inferiority of today's tragedy, the, the truly significant difference between modern and classical tragedians is in philosophical vision. The former's, the modern's, uh, pessimism being no match for the latter's, uh, classical's ultimate optimism. Classical tragedy centers a choice. A tragic end can be averted if one chooses correctly. Oedipus chooses to kill a stranger, a man whom he later learns was his birth father, and elects to marry a woman whom he learns was his mother. Uh, lessons of morality and ethics appear within the realized consequences of these freely elected choices. Oedipus's recognition of his complicity in the unfolding events motivates him to blind himself in addition to embracing a self-imposed exile of uh, banishment. For the audience, recognition invites pity. It also helps, to under, helps them to understand that tragic consequences can be avoided by acting in a just or moral manner. Zaliski correctly points to a pessimistic streak within modern American drama. This certainly is the case with Dutchman. Clay does not make choices that lead to his demise. Although it could be argued that he tempted fate simply by talking with Lula, and countless black men have been cautioned about the dangers of socializing with white women, 
Indeed, Baraka's grandmother's story, again, is an instance of this. The reality is that the protagonist did not have an option not to interact with Lula. She sought him out. Her movements and speech indicate that she was not going to allow him to ignore her. His fate was sealed at the moment that, he, that Lula boarded the train. Black death, and more generally, suffering on stage is not new. From Henry Box Brown's a dramatic reenactment of his escape from the conditions of slavery, uh, to Angelina Welt Grimke's treatise on lynching and Rachel, to innumerable references to racial struggle in August Wilson's dramaturgy, the theatrical stage has long depicted the precarity of black existence. The loss of life haunts many of the most canonical texts in African-American theater. The drama of Charles Fuller's A Soldier's Play rests on identifying the murderer, the murderer of a black sergeant among a group of enlisted soldiers. Susan Lori Parks' top dog underdog centers an African-American Lincoln impersonator whose job is to be assassinated repeatedly. Katori Hall's The Mountaintop 2009 presents a human portrait of Martin Luther King Jr. only hours before his assassination, so death looms large in that piece as well. The black bodies in Brandon Jacobs Jenkins appropriate are the men hanged in American lynchings. It is the fear of death that inspires the protagonist of Susan Lori Parks' most recent play, White Noise, to the extent that he desires to become a slave, the property of another, as a means of protection. New Blackfest, a New York City-based producing initiative and commons for black theater, commissions Facing, uh, Facing Our Truth Timid Plays on Trayvon Martin. The following year, New Blackfest created Hands Up, Seven Playwrights, in response to the death of Michael Brown. But one initiative I want to talk about today um, is Black Lives, Black Words, created and produced by Reggie Edmund, Reginald Edmund, sorry, it's a friend of mine, <laughs> Reginald Edmund. Uh, originally Chicago-based and consisting of 10-minute plays uh, penned by Chicago playwrights, Black Lives has been staged in uh, more than a dozen cities, including Toronto, London, Minneapolis, Chicago, of course, and more, with each event incorporating local voices. Referring to Black Lives, Edmund recalls, I started Black Lives, Black Words because I felt there needed to be an opportunity for me as a playwright to speak out against the sins committed in this world inflicted upon black bodies. Michael Brown, Trayvon Martin, Sandra Bland, Tamir Rice, and the countless many others. This in turn caused me to wonder what other artists were out there that possessed this overwhelming desire to speak out for the unheard voices. Organized on a shoestring budget, Black Lives is a grassroots nonprofit initiative Performances, which are free, aim to create community dialogue and prompt communities to respond to the loss of life. In advance of a Black Lives, Black Words London event, Edmund outlined his goals, and I quote, this project will give voice to some of the most contemporary political black writers from both the US and the UK, asking them to explore the question, do black lives matter today? Each will write a 10 to 15 minute play to address the political, economical, and cultural, as well as the social and academic issues related to the black experiences of the 21st century. This project will serve as a comparative study to raise awareness of the shared and different transatlantic experiences in the black community and evaluate the impact that it has had on the black community at large. What the various black lives plays and spoken word interludes demonstrate is a widely felt national border crossing concern about the murders of black people. In Dominique Morisot's Black Lives play, Giselle the Gazelle, the story centers on a young woman who participates in a running race on a local street. She hears a gunshot sickling the star of the race and soon learns that the sound and audience exclamations weren't race related. And she, she, she says, but that wasn't cheers, that was screaming and it wasn't a sound effect, it was real sirens. And Rashid wasn't on my heels, he was behind me, far, far behind me on the ground, not moving, not moving, not moving. In this instance, the running black body was read as a body seeking to evade capture. It was stopped killed by the police. This intrusion of the police and the everydayness of black folk appears in Winsome Pennock's uh, The Principles of Cartography. An elderly black woman, Abby, witnesses the arrest and tasing of a young black boy. Frustrated by the frequency of such encounters and reminded of the history of black mistreatment throughout the Middle Passage, she declares, and I quote, after 300 years of enduring one indignity after another, I have had enough. As I watch the paralyzed boy face down the ground, I know what I have to do. I have nothing to lose. Um, in a moment, I am out in the open, face to face with the officer. 300 years I've waited to see you again. You and that dog of yours have crossed oceans, deserts, space, and time in pursuit of me. Why can't you just let me be? Let this young man go. He has done nothing wrong. A giggle escapes from him, from the officer. His eyes flash with recognition, although he is in pains to pretend that he doesn't know who I am. He ignores me and speaks in the radio. 
My chest swells in anger. I snatch the taser and hold it against the officer's head. Do you know how many times I've dreamed of this? Imagine taking your whip out of your hand, letting you have a taste of it. His colleagues stand back. This is not their fight. His forehead is slippery and wet with sweat. Um, he puts his hand up and backs away, but I'm too quick for him. I aim, I fire. The wires shoot straight into his head. As he hits the ground, his big purple tongue rolls out of his mouth. In Reggie Edmonds' contribution, Everybody Loves Big E, Edmund Lucy tells the story of Eric Garner, the street corner merchant who was strangled to death in Staten Island. In this account, Big E is a street corner cigarette seller who witnesses a young street merchant being harassed by the police. Big E intervenes on his behalf. His presence is now deemed a threat. His book bag, which holds his identification, is now considered a place to hide a weapon. Big E is killed. What unites the many, many plays within the Black Lives, Black Words collection, as well as Baraka's Dutchman, is the public settings in which black people are stopped, arrested, and often killed. In each case, the individuals are enjoying their everyday lives, and the tragic impresses itself upon them. The frequency of black suffering and death has prompted scholars to employ the language of the horror genre, specifically zombies, to address the frequency of black death and the visibility of dead black bodies. In their dissertations, performance studies scholar Kashif Powell and historian Jean-Pierre Brutus separately spotlight the close associations of blackness and death. Ident uh, Powell identifies, and I quote, the unyielding relationship between the black body and the history of death, which he argues constitutes black existence. Brutus identifies, and I quote, the living dead as the main form of power faced by colonized populations. Zombies, even when present as the white walking dead, generally are identified as being representative of blackness. Che Lee in her article, and I love this, it's my favorite article title of all time, uh, good, girls don't date de good, good Girls Don't Date Dead Boys, um, you know, uh, you know, expresses this fact most clearly. The zombie becomes a substitute for the black body. I am less interested in zombies as we have inherited uh, the concept through nearly a century of cultural criticism and more fascinated by the walking dead. In most accounts of zombie culture, critics are quick to note that its emergence within popular culture emerged or occurred as a result of accounts of Haitian voodoo uh, circulating in the 1920s in the midst of the US occupation of Haiti between 1915 and 1934, and the popular embrace of William Seabrook's novel, The Magic Island, uh, which introduced Haitian religious practice uh, to a large readership. Seabrook writes, and I quote, like Lazarus from the dead, the zombie, they say, is a soulless human corpse, still dead, but taken from the grave and endowed by sorcery with, with a mechanical semblance of life. It is a dead body which is made to walk and act and moves, move as if it were alive. Now, the challenge with borrowing the language of the zombie is that it, un it unintentionally carries with it an association with a hybridized religious practice premised on a colonialist characterization of African diasporic cultural practices within the Caribbean. Overdetermined from the start, the concept does not adequately address the very specific social temporal circumstances of black death within the 20th and 21st century. Instead, I prefer the idea of the undead which remains sufficiently elastic to account for both the actuality of death and the futurity of death in association with, association with blackness. Black death, its material presence and haunting legacy looms almost everywhere. In Chicago, where I lived for 15 years, black death is almost a daily reality. It was not uncommon for a person to be shot and sometimes killed nearly every single day during the summer months. It is the everydayness of death, the predictable frequency with which black folks will be killed occasionally simply because of their blackness that intrigues me. I am interested in the spectacle of black death as an everyday anticipated event and anticipated element in life. Regardless of the circumstances of a particular death being dragged, being hanged, being shot in the back, strangled, the rapid pace at which they occur renders them common. I am fascinated by the normalization of black death and dead black bodies within society and the expectation that black living bodies, especially black youth, are predestined to become the arrested, the attacked, and the murdered. In thinking about blackness, death, and performance, the unifying element is the concept of becoming dead or undead. To be undead is to be not dead. The Oxford English Dictionary slightly clarifies this definition, and I love the OED because it's, it's, you'll see. Uh, the definition here of being uh, for the undead is not dead, alive, <laughs> Also, not quite dead, <laughs> but not fully alive. Yeah. Dead and alive. <laughs> Thank you, OED. Uh, you know. 
Uh, in their edited collection, Undead Souths, uh, uh, Eric Gary Anderson, Taylor Haggard, and Daniel Cross Turner write, and I quote, undeadness describes a wide continuum of posthumous phenomena, from funerary rites and mourning practices to shocking, overwhelming effect, affect of terrifying spectacles and post-traumatic flashbacks, to figures from beyond death, ghosts, vampires, zombies, but also corpses unburied, decayed, desecrated, dismembered, yet still filled with life or a kind of life, be it with the multitude of microorganisms drawing sustenance from the decomposing bodies or the physical afterlife of remembering the dead. So a lot of things. The editors offer a capacious definition, uh, including both zombies and a wide variety of, of posthumous phenomena. Their experiences, uh, sorry, their emphasis on the experience of the memory and affect of death most appeals to me. Undeadness is the felt sense of mourning and perhaps trauma related to death. Uh, Robert Buke and Johannes Turk note in the introduction to their special issue of the Germanic Review uh, that the concept of undeadness can be extended beyond the no longer living. You know, citing the experience of the survivors of the disappeared um, from South America, they observe, and I quote, the concept of the undead does not only apply to those whose death cannot be proven, clinically or otherwise, and therefore uh, remains symbolically in suspense, it may apply no less to the living themselves. The walking, living, conceptualized as dead motivates the study. I am entranced not by the experience of the disappeared who suddenly reappear and therefore seems to live again. Uh, so, sorry, I am entranced not only by the experience of the disappeared who suddenly reappear and therefore live again, but I'm also equally interested in the consistently present and marked bodies whose everyday appearance exists as a reminder of their future demise. The undead is the living body who appears destined for death and therefore already dead. It is the walking dead with a difference. Understood in this manner, the concept of undeadness allows us to appreciate and better understand the experience of black people who found themselves positioned as the enforced witnesses to the types of abuses described by Frederick Douglass in his narrative, and despite their social activism compelled, as Caritha Mitchell has put it, to live with lynching. To be undead is to be very much alive, indeed actively alive, but surrounded by the seemingly, by the, by the seemingly inescapable presence of death. It is to stand on the shore and watch the corpse of Denby sink into the red tinged water of the creek. It is to go to the field after the crowd is dispersed and either cut down the hanged body or gather the dismembered and discarded parts of it. It is to stand in a queue or pick up an issue of Jet, a sort of magazine, and look at length into the face of Emmett Till. The experience of blackness is not only to walk amongst the dead, but also to understand that your experience in the world is related to that of the drowned, the hanged, the dismembered, the shot, the clubbed. It is to see your future as potentialities in the present realities, the stillness of others. In the phenomenology of perception, uh, Merleau-Ponty centers the body as a point of view upon the world, and in so doing provides a critical framework to better understand both self-awareness and social interaction. It is, through our it is through our observations of the world that we inhabit and the actions of others that we obtain a better appreciation of ourselves. You know, to put it this way, we learn about ourselves by looking at others, you know, a sense of our self-awareness within, you know, her environment. Uh, an emphasis on being and perception facilitates insight into the experience of blackness. Aligned with Du Bois' concept of double consciousness, perception brings into focus the fact that our sense of self emerges from our look at others. We see our reality, the convergence of the past, the present, the future within this look at another. The witnessing and internalization of another's experience can create the sense of being undead. Uh, the deceased reanimated. This is what happened during the funeral of Emmett Till. Mamie Till Bradley was not the first mother to recover the tortured body of her son. Thousands of other mothers, family members, and neighbors had to cut down the hanging bodies of loved ones or search the ashes of bonfires for bones in order to properly bury them. What distinguished the Till case was that the public display of black bodily suffering was not reserved solely for white spectators. Bradley invited black communities at large to look upon her son. She publicized her in Till's pain. The open coffin funeral coupled with the circulation of Till's photographs in the pages of black newspapers triggered what can best be described as a new trend and perhaps an early moment within American popular culture of exhaustion by white audiences at the spectacle of black suffering. Southern townships, similar to those who circulated postcards before of lynchings um, during the mur murderous heyday, they now discouraged the display of uh, Till's body and image. The public white fascination with the abused black body on show had declined, and the image of black suffering was reframed almost exclusively for a black audience. In addition to representing the exhausted interests of residents of white townships, the images proved exhausting to many members of black communities. Whereas local, county, and state officials in Mississippi suggested that Till's body and photograph did not merit a long look out of fear of aggravating racial tensions, black viewers often found themselves 
uh, drawn to the picture with your eyes lingering upon the body, uh, uh, lingering upon the boy's misshapen face. As the Reverend Al Sharpton noted, uh, referring to Till's face, it is hard to, it is hard to view a corpse uh, and look away. Indeed, the murder of Till prompted his contemporaries, tweens and teenagers, to see their possible future in his past abuse. In an often cited passage from his autobiography, boxer Muhammad Ali remembered, and I quote, Emmett Till and I were about the same age. A week after he was murdered, I stood on the corner with a gang of boys, looking at pictures in the black newspapers and magazines. In one, he was laughing and happy. In the other, his head was swollen and bashed in, his eyes bulging out of their sockets, and his mouth twisted and broken. His mother had done a bold thing. She refused to let him be buried until hundreds of thousands marched past his open casket in Chicago and looked down at his mutilated body. I, Ali, felt a deep kinship to him when I learned he was born the same year and day I was. My father and I talked about it at night and dramatized the crime. Neither in Ali's autobiography nor in various other academic uh, treatments of this um, a reflection of his is the nature of that dramatization you know, uh, I searched, I searched. I was like, what did he and his father do, right? Because that's a performance historian, right? Um, um, uh, regardless of which scene was reenacted by young Cassius uh, and his father, the future heavyweight's age, combined with his presumed role play as Till, encourages efforts to comprehend the Chicagoans' death on his life. For a moment, Ali became Till, a person whom he easily could have been. Former Mississippi resident and author Ann Moody, who was only a few months older than Emmett Till when he died, observed in her autobiography, and I quote, before Emmett Till's murder, I had known the fear of hunger, hell, and the devil. But now there was a new fear known to me, the fear of being killed just because I was black. To think of blackness in terms of indebtedness invites a consideration of the ways in which death haunts or ghosts black bodies. It is also to appreciate how a person's sense of self emerges from a prolonged look at the dead, the corpse, or an image of the deceased. The look at the dead creates an awareness of mortality, not simply the inevitability of one's own death that everyone faces, but an understanding that the futurity of one's own death is connected with blackness. We can see this in the activism surrounding the death of Trayvon Martin, specifically the Million Hoodie March. Uh, these performances sought not to resurrect, Mar not to resurrect Martin, but rather to position the activists in the stead of Martin as a virtual body. The performance alongside the assertion, we are all Trayvon, did not reanimate the dead, but rather figures the living body in the place of the deceased. The same can be said about the hands up, don't shoot performances that follow the killing of Michael Brown. These enactments become performances of undeadness in which the living walk as the dead. In the theater, new life is continuously breathed into previously expired objects and characters. This cycle is magnified when matters, specifically the precariousness of black life, appear on stage. We can see this in Dutchman, with the discarding of the black body of clay and its replacement with the arrival of a new passenger. We can see this in Reggie Edmonds' Black Lives collection, in which the still body, either paralyzed by a taser or killed by a bullet, is omnipresent before a sea of witnesses. In each, the dead exist alongside the undead. In conclusion, I acknowledge that the futurity of death in relation to blackness is not nearly as pronounced on this side of the Atlantic as the other. However, I believe that as we acknowledge the differences, we should also not overlook the similarities. For example, The Guardian in January noted that racial profiling is increasingly becoming a problem. Four years ago, black, Brit uh, 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 black British men uh, and women um, were 2.6 times more likely to be stopped than whites, and today they are 4.3. The, the, the image on the left, the image on, the, on your left actually refers to, the top one refers to drug stops. But in terms of overall police stops, uh, if, you're, if you are a black British um, uh, man or woman, you were 4.6 you, you times more likely to be stopped by the police than a white uh, person. Um, uh, I am mindful of the elevation of hate speech and threats of violence across the country. And regrettably, on, on university campuses, which has led select universities, including this one, the University of Exeter, to expel students deemed to be a threat to black students. And of course, stories of racial violence are not geographically bound. They travel and in so doing, shape perspectives and expectations of blackness. Last, last, last few sentences. With my final sentences, I want to return back across the Atlantic. This week, the best-selling book for middle grade readers, tween readers, 10, 11, 12-year-olds, is Angie Thomas's The Hate You Give, about a black girl who witnesses uh, the killing by the police of her friends. It has been a bestseller for two and a half years, 
<laughs> and of course, inspired a film. So you might have seen the film. You didn't read the book. Another bestseller aimed at a slightly younger reader, uh, Ghost Boys by Jewel Parker Rhodes, is about a boy killed by the police who walks the earth as a ghost among other boys who were killed by the police, including Emmett Till. These books center death within the imagination of youth, especially black youth, and frame untimely death, lives cut short as common, predictable, and easily relatable. To conclude, to be alive alongside so much death is not really life. It is a form of death, a manner of being undead. Thank you. Mm -hmm.